Hello and welcome to this video about the anatomy of the human hand. My name is Emily and my name is Keishni and today we will talk about the bones of the hand, the muscles of the hand and how to test the function of some of these muscles. We, we hope, hope you enjoyed enjoy this production. production. Okay. To begin with, there are eight carpal bones which form the base of the hand. Assuming anatomical position, just like Emily showing you right here, the thumb, with the thumb on the lateral side and the little finger on the medial side, there are four bones that make up the proximal row. Working laterally to medially, the proximal row is formed by the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquetrum, and the pisiform. The distal row, again, working laterally for medially, is formed by the trapezium, the trapezoid, the capitate, and the hamate. A good mnemonic to remember these carpal bones is scared lovers try proposals that they can't handle. Moving towards the digits, there are five metacarpals, one for each digit. So we have the first one on the, for the thumb, then the second, the third, and the fourth, and lastly the fifth for the little finger. Next up we have the, the proximal, the middle, and the distal phalanx. It is important to note that the thumb only has a proximal and a distal phalanx. Muscles that act on the hand can be divided into two groups, extrinsic and intrinsic. Extrinsic muscles are located in the forearm, while the intrinsic muscles are located in the hand itself. These intrinsic muscles allow for fine motor of the hand. We will be looking at the muscles that make up the hand, starting with the deepest layer on the palmar surface. The first layer is formed by the four dorsal interossi muscles. Each muscle arises from two heads from the lateral and medial surface of the metacarpals and inserts into the first, second and third digit. These muscles allow for abduction of the digits away from the central axis made up of the middle finger. They are innervated by the ulnar nerve. But the primary function of this group is to abduct the digits. The next layer is made up of three palmar interossi muscles. These muscles originate on the metacarpal shaft and they insert into the proximal phalanx of the second, fourth and fifth digits. The action of these muscles is to allow adduction towards the central axis. These muscles, like the dorsal interossi muscles, are innervated by the ulnar nerve. Specifically, these three palmar interossi muscles arise from the volar ridges of the metacarpals, whereas the dorsal interossi arises from the adjacent sides of the metacarpals. In order to test the function of the second palmar interosseous muscle, ask your patient to adduct the index finger against resistance. A good mnemonic to remember the functions of the dorsal and the palmar interossi muscles is dab and pad. So dorsal is abduction, hence dab, and palmar is adduction, hence pad. The next group of muscles are the four lumbricals. These muscles originate from the tendons of flexor digitorum profundus and pass posteriorly and laterally to insert into the lateral surface of the extensor expansion. In terms of innervation, the lateral two lumbricals, which make up the second and the third digit, are innervated by the median nerve, while the medial two lumbricals, which make up the fourth and the fifth digit, are innervated by the ulnar nerve. The adductor pollicis forms the next layer of muscles. However, for the purpose of this course, you are not required to know the details of this muscle. The adductor pollicis muscle inserts onto the base of the proximal phalanx of the thumb and arises from the third metacarpal. This is termed the transverse head. The oblique head, on the other hand, arises from the base of the second and third metacarpals, and both muscles are innervated by the ulnar nerve. The primary function of these muscles are to adduct and flex the thumb. The next group of muscles that the girls will be looking at are the muscle bulges on the medial and lateral aspects of the palm. The group of muscles on the medial side of the palm at the base of the little finger produce the hypothena eminence. Meanwhile, the group on the lateral side of the palm at the base of the thumb produce the thena eminence. These muscles take origin from the flexor retinaculum and the adjacent bones. There are three muscles that make up the thena eminence. 
The deepest muscle is the opponent's pollicis, which allows for opposition of the thumb. Flexor pollicis brevis allows for flexion of the thumb at the metacarpophalangeal joint, as well as abductor pollicis brevis, which allows for ad abduction of the thumb. Just like the thena eminence, the hypothena eminence is made up of three muscles. The deepest of these muscles is the opponent's digiti minimi, which, as the name suggests, allows opposition of the fifth digit, or the pinky finger. The most superficial is abductor digiti minimi, which allows for abduction of the little finger. Lateral to abductor digiti minimi is flexor digiti minimi brevis, which allows for flexion at the metacarpal phalangeal joint of the fifth digit. Collectively, these muscles are innervated by the ulnar nerve. This concludes the intrinsic muscles that make up the hand. We will now move on to some of the extrinsic muscles which originate in the forearm but exert their actions on the digits. The deepest layer of the extrinsic muscles is the flexor digitorum profundus. The flexor digitorum profundus originates from the coronoid process of the ulna and inserts onto the distal phalanges of digits 2 to 5. To test the flexor digitorum superficialis, the practitioner should place their fingers on the patient's first interphalangeal joint. The patient should then try flexing their fingers against this resistance while the proximal phalanges remain fixed. The flexor digitorum superficialis, similar to the flexor digitorum profundus, also flexes the wrist and digits. It is innervated by the median nerve. It originates from the humerus medial epicondyle the ulnar coronoid process and the radius shaft and inserts into the phalanges 2 to 5. The practitioner should place their fingers on the patient's second and third digit, which is the index and middle finger, and ask them to flex their distal phalanges while keeping their proximal and middle phalanges extended. If the patient is unable to flex their distal phalanges, the flexor digitorum may be damaged. Flexor pollicis longus originates from the anterior surface of the radius and the interosseous membrane and it inserts onto the palmar base of the distal phalanx of the thumb. Flexor pollicis longus allows for flexion of the thumb, just like flexor pollicis brevis, which is part of the thena eminence mentioned before. It's also innervated by the median nerve. That concludes our presentation on the anatomy of the hand. We hope you found it helpful and if you have any questions, please comment below.